you so much for coming to my panel. Um, I ran over here, so, <laughs> and then I spilled water, so, a uh, little frazzled. But, uh, um, I really think that in order to understand how a costume is made, you really need to go through and, um, like, I really want to do a presentation on one of my costumes, so, because I think we oftentimes will see a finished costume and it is so beautiful and so detailed and so perfectly made that uh, a lot of times it's very difficult for us to um, sort of understand how it was made or understand how, it, like, it, it seems so effortless and so easy. And uh, so I think for all of us cosplayers, there's always a backstory to our costumes. And um, for years, I've been asked by conventions to do uh, panels on costume craftsmanship. But I think that doing a simple, you know, general craftsmanship panel can tend to be a little boring because you're just going through techniques can be kind of dry. So I uh, wanted to do a presentation on how one of my costumes was made step by step. So I basically will take you guys through each of the um, steps I took to make this costume, which is Carmilla from Vampire Hunter D. Um, I get a lot of questions about this costume still, even though I made it in 2009. Um, but it was certainly a very special costume to me, a very special challenge. And uh, the character was someone that I have watched on the screen since the movie came out for nine years. The movie came out in 2000. And uh, for the first eight years of, of those, I never felt like I had the skill to make this costume. So it was, she was never on my list of characters that I wanted to cosplay. Like it wasn't even a possibility. Um, but as my you know, skills improved in cosplay and my experience grew, uh, I thought all of a sudden, you know, actually I think I could maybe possibly think of a way to do it. And that's when I sort of, you know, nine years later, uh, pushed myself to finally make this costume. So it certainly was a milestone costume. So the first, uh, the first is, of course, you always start with reference. I get really obsessive about finding reference, and I research a lot about the character. So I watched the movie over and over again, and even though she is only in the movie for like five minutes total, uh, I watched her scenes over and over again and took screenshots until I felt like I really kind of understood how this outfit uh, is supposed to be. And um, with a lot of character designs, they really are sort of out of this world. I, they're designed by people who are not fashion designers. They don't understand how garments are supposed to sit. And so it's very like anti-gravity, you know, on a lot of different costumes. And this certainly is one of those. Um, and that's why it was really challenging for me to try to recreate the silhouette and uh, sort of the feel of the character. Like, for me, it's never really about being 100% accurate. I've never been a cosplayer who was 100% accurate with any of her costumes. None of my costumes is 100% accurate. And I think that's okay because we each have our own expression of a character and it's like we view a character differently and that's what's so great about cosplay is because you can get a thousand people cosplaying the same character, but they will do it in a different way, and the costume will look a little bit different, and that's it was is what makes cosplay so creative and such a great form of expression, because you are sharing your own vision of a character. You're not doing somebody else's. You're not doing the the official version. You know, this is this is you as whoever. And so I just wanted to get across from Carmilla the, the um, sort of like the, obviously like the, the, the fact that she's a villain, um, the fact that she's a vampire, but also think about, you know, royalness behind, you know, her, her character. She's very rich. I thought about what kind of fabric she might be wearing. Uh, so instead of just choosing 
any red fabric, you know, to match the, the colors, I also think a lot about texture and uh, think about patterns. So for Carmilla, there definitely was a lot of um, preparation before I even started making the costume. So these photos were taken in 2009, so I will apologize in advance. Some of them are very, very bad <laughs> photos and really, my, my room back then was very messy. And I also um, did not have as much knowledge and skills as I do now. So that's the other reason I really like showing this costume because you get to see sort of the progression of, uh, you know, my skills, but also like what materials were available in the cosplay community back then. So in 2009, we did not have Warbla, so I did not, uh, you know, I had no possibility of making her shoulder pads with Warbla, so the only material that was uh, easily accessible was craft foam. So I made the, uh, sort of tested out the shoulder pads with craft foam, and it's just hot glued together. And, um, here, the top, is, the top white parts are actually um, Wonderflex. Wonderflex was available and was actually really new uh, in 2009. And uh, we all were just sort of like, that was sort of like the, the big hype back then. We're like, oh my god, there's a plastic that you can heat up and then it will stay the shape. <laughs> so that's like really exciting. <laughs> Yeah, and so all of these pieces are foam and uh, Wonder Flex. And uh, after I made the, the, just the, the shapes, then I covered them with uh, velvet. Um, velvet was the main fabric that I chose for this costume because I thought it would really photograph very luxuriously and, uh, it, you know, like high quality velvet, sort of very, it's very like luxury fabric, you know, royalty. And so I used the same template to make the uh, covers, and um, I used a, a gold, uh, sort of like a, it's an upholstery like curtain fabric, because I wanted the gold part to have some sort of a texture to it to contrast against the very smooth velvet. And uh, there was just a lot of like very careful hand sewing as well as gluing of uh, the pieces to the foam and Wonderflex shapes. Um, all the black trim that you see on the right here, it uh, is like the, it's like one trim that I was able to find in a lot of yardage. And uh, it was like I bought so much of that trim that I think the entire state of Georgia, which is pretty big, like was out of that trim. Like I called every Joanne store and was like, I need this specific trim, this SKU number in black. And I don't even know how many hundreds of yards. So this is sort of like the, the pieces finished. And it's very interesting that the first, the first piece of, um, of shoulder pad, like, like the, the first one took me over 20 hours to make. And then the second one took only like five hours to make. So it's really crazy and it's funny to think that the, the, anytime you have to repeat something, you know, you're so much faster, it always looks better. So I, I kind of actually learned from this project that I should always start with uh, experimenting with a part of a costume that's like in the back or hidden or not as prominent. So it's like, even if I'm sewing designs on, I'll kind of start with the back designs before I move on to the front and center designs and such. Because like, you do get really, like you, you do gain in speed and proficiency pretty fast if you have to do something um, over and over again. So the sleeves, this is sort of like her, her sleeves um, are, are like really large stripes. And uh, so I used two different fabrics and um, cut lots of strips and searched them together. And uh, as you can see, they both have a texture because again, I really love texture. I think it just adds to a costume so much more. Like a fabric choice can make such a huge difference in the look of a costume and the authenticity of a costume. And I was really happy with both of these materials that I found. And um, this is sort of like preparing to attach the sleeves to the train cape thing. 
that's like I don't know how I mean I only know in do I only know in meters I or do I only know I only know in feet it's 16 feet long I have no idea how much that is in meters that's eight meters or a little less than eight meters so the red basically uh, is a really really long piece of fabric and um, I had to line it in and I, I chose a very slippery lining fabric so that was a lot of fun trying to sew slippery velvet with slippery lining fabric so that was a lot of cursing and uh, I you'll see me kind of jumping back and forth a little bit in these photos but they are actually kind of chronological so this is basically me uh, spreading out the different the different pieces of the costume and tackling them as separate projects. That's the only way that I know how to make a, a costume is if I don't approach it as a full project. I literally have to look at each sleeve, it's its own separate little project. And you know, the bodice, it's one project. And you know, the headpiece is one project. Um, because otherwise, I get really overwhelmed. So this also allows me to uh, sort of jump back and forth between tasks because sometimes I get really sick of doing something like I get really sick of sewing you know strips of velvet you know again and again and again and I'm just like all right I'm done with that and instead of being frustrated or if something is not working um, I can set it down and simply look at my to-do list and move on to another smaller project and that sort of keeps me focused and keeps my productivity going so uh, this is the sort of the patterning out and the lining of the um, the open bodice and um, I as you can see the there's steel boning so this is the white is the flat steel boning and um, I'm marking out um, where they are going to go inside the bodice and here I'm like okay I've like patterned the bodice now I'm moving on to the uh, the collar so the collar is another example of uh, sort of like the how little was available and also how little I knew when I made this outfit like these days now I would make this collar totally different I would flat pattern it I would probably use foam so that it's lightweight but then I would shape it and you know really make sure it had that nice 3d feel but in 2009 I had no idea how to do that and so the only thing I could think of was to bend a wire frame you know, like spending hours trying to bend a wireframe into the, the shape of the collar, which looks kind of like a 3D mushroom. And uh, then I heated up Wonder Flex and I stretched it over it, like burning my hands the entire time, because who wears gloves? You know, you're just like heating it up and then the wire gets really hot and the Wonder Flex, and you're just like, but it has to go around. And so this is sort of like my crowning achievement after a whole day. <laughs> And it's just like, and it's like uneven. You're just like, oh, what the heck? But um, then what you do is you cover it. So like, if you make mistakes, it doesn't look that good. You just put stuff on it and cover it up. <laughs> so this, uh, I put a ton of batting, like a batting to sort of like soften the, because it was really rough because of the Wonder Flex. It was really bumpy. So I, so I put layers of batting over it, and then I stretched. Uh, a nice thick satin over it and uh, glued everything down so that it looked nice and slick and uh, of course a lot of the black trim went on and it kind of worked so I was really happy so this is the back the back is velvet and uh, all those uh, black uh, trims and such were sewn on and uh, I was really frustrated with how sort of it, because the velvet doesn't stretch and this is a 3D shape and I didn't want to glue it down because it, the glue would possibly seep through because it's very thin and delicate. So I just kind of stretched it around and only uh, stitched and glued it down around the edges. So it's kind of like wrinkly in the middle and I was entering a contest with this costume and I was sure that the wrinkles in the collar would like would, would, would deduct so many points that I would not stand a chance. Like I was so upset over this, the wrinkles in the collar and I was like, it's not perfect, it's not what I wanted, but then I didn't have time to redo it. And I learned that once I got to the convention, 
nobody cared. Like, not a single soul ever told me, talked to me about, there are wrinkles in your collar. Like, nobody has ever said anything. And I did win the contest, so the judges obviously did not mind. And uh, so that was a really big lesson where you really, like, you may think that you did something wrong and it doesn't look good and, and it doesn't matter. Nobody walks around with, like, a Rolodex of reference pictures of every character and compares, you know, this is not exactly the right width or this is not the right color. Like, people may do that at home behind their computer screens if they have no life, but they're not gonna do it to your face. You will never have to worry about, you know, your your mistakes showing up. It, it, that really truly solidifies my belief that all cosplay is, is for you to get the feel and the, 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 the feel of a character across. That's it. You're just translating a character into a, a real person. And as long as people see you and they recognize the character, they're happy because that might be their favorite character. They're not going to nitpick you. Okay, so the collar is done. Eee! And um, the other reason I really liked the Carmilla costume is it gave me the option to do all kinds of different techniques. I really like learning new techniques and I, I like costumes that incorporate a variety of techniques. So Carmilla required some sculpting and casting as well because she has a very, very big uh, gold necklace that looks very organic and really had to be cast or I mean, these days, I probably could have made it out of Warbla, but... <laughs> so, I made a urethane mold uh, of all the different pieces, and then cast them out of uh, white resin, and sort of had to, like, this is, I think, before they were sanded down, even. And I also, um, I also sculpted the, the sort of, like, the, the jewel, like, the, I don't know, she's like a jewel band around her, um, around her hair. And I was like, so it basically has to be a cone, like a giant bracelet that is like a cone shape. So I'm like, what am I going to do? Do I really want to, like, you know, make it hard and rigid? And I was like, I'm going to make it out of rubber so I can bend it. So this is... Uh, this is sort of the clay, and then here's the mold, and um, it actually was cast out of urethane. So I could literally just bend it around and just, uh, you know, just attach it and cut it wherever it needed to be. So the hair is another separate project that took about two days, I think. Um, so I just started with combs from, uh, you know, a hobby shop, and I. You know, this was before the days of like nice wigs. Uh, any cool colored wigs that you wanted for cosplay, you had to buy on eBay. So I bought two cherry red wigs from China on eBay and I cut one of them apart. And that's something I still really like doing is um, if I need to, like, if I need to, um, like even if I can buy a weft of the same hair, like the same hair color and such for a costume, I sometimes still prefer to buy a second wig because the the second wig will have a, you know, you have a skin top that you can then cut apart and you can actually use that skin top um, and have a little more versatility with, with it. So this is just like putting all the hair on the cones, lots of hair cones. And it doesn't look that, you know, it really doesn't look that great right now. Like I just, you know, popped them onto the second wig and I used a curved needle to sort of like stitch around it to secure it. And as you can see, you can see the seams and it doesn't look that great. And so that's where like the second hair, uh, the skin top really came in handy because I kept it. So I literally just slapped it on and kind of stitched it down. So all of a sudden I had all this extra hair that was attached to a, a skin top that already, you know, that I could blend into the wig and make it look more natural. So that just looks already so much better than before. And um, we did not have, uh, you know, we did not have um, uh, lace front wigs in 2009. Um, that was reserved for celebrities and, and Hollywood movies. Like uh, there were no really commercially available lace front wigs. 
And also Carmilla has a really weird lace front and uh, it was like punching lace was like this, this Hollywood secret, you know, like no one really knew about it unless you were working in Hollywood. And so I actually got the idea of making my own fake hair front from um, the, the cosplayers uh, Ryoko Demon and Radol from Russia, because when they did their Team Rocket, she made a fake hairline with, with hair and just basically cut in you know, cut in spikes to, to simulate the hairline. And I thought that was so brilliant. So I kind of took inspiration from that and did my own hairline, because Carmilla's hairline is very evil looking and very, you know, specific. So it's honestly just a piece of craft foam, you know, that I sort of cut around my head and, you know, fit it and uh, then just uh, sewed onto the wig and then blended into the wig. And I think back then I used like, yeah, you can see the, the, the white glue, it's just like the white school glue on the left here, it's just watered down glue that you just paint onto the hair and let it dry overnight and then you have like rigid hair. So um, the finishing for the bodice had to be done sort of with a lot of hand sewing. And I really hemmed and hawed for a really long time about how to do the open front because very obviously a huge part of uh, Carmilla's character's costume is that the bodice is completely open down below her belly button. And I, you know, went through all kinds of thoughts like, do I? Do I do a body mold of myself and then like make a shell and then yeah, you know, create the outfit around the shell so that the shell will keep it closed? Or, you know, do I, I mean, do I like make like a wire frame around like my whole, uh, my whole front that goes like around my neck and like all kinds of really complicated thinking. And in the end, I was just like, you know what, screw it, I'm just gonna use fishing line. So it truly is a, it's a bone bodice um, that supports itself. So basically the bodice, once I put it on and close it, it actually will kind of stay like, the, it will stay and, and hold its shape. But having the fishing line sort of in a crisscross in the front just makes sure that it holds it close and gives it tension. So um, it was sort of a very, like it really was sort of one of those things where I realized that sometimes you can really overcomplicate something. You can really think about a, uh, a solution that is very difficult and expensive and complicated. And sometimes it is worth it to just try a very simple um, idea and you never know if it's gonna work or not. And so simplifying things um, is sometimes really, like, well, will keep your sanity. And um, it worked really well for my outfit. Um, the fishing line was not really that noticeable. Um, and in photos, uh, some photographers even photoshopped it out and then, then it was like, okay. Um, here's the back of the costume, which this was one part that I really wanted to, uh, I kind of wanted to be accurate on um, because in the movie, they're very, prominent back shots of Carmilla where she doesn't have lacing in the back. And I wanted my um, I wanted my bodice to lace up, but I did not want to have a zipper or you know lacing showing. So I kind of made a second layer uh, fake back. So like basically made two two layers uh, for the back portion and um, did the lacing with the grommets normally and did Velcro for the outer shell so that it Velcros down and smoothly so you don't have a zipper seam, and which I think in hindsight I could probably have done in a visible zipper, but back then I really was shit at installing invisible zippers. So again, I'm like, I don't know Velcro, duh, go. <laughs> so, um, so I think that was the last progress. So before we really move on, any questions about the costume or did I go too fast on something or, so yeah, I think you had your hand first. How did you attach the color to the uh, bodice? Mm. Giant snaps. Yeah, like the same kind of snaps I have right here on this. I think the, the, these, those other snaps were like twice as big. 
So everything is just snapped on, and um, I really like using snaps. And uh, magnets is also another good, good, you know, attachment system. But uh, yeah, those were just like basically the the snaps were on the inside of the bodice. So like they literally just the, the collar went around and snapped on the inside. And same with the shoulder pads, they were snapped on, and the hip pads, they were all snapped on. And the snaps were, let me see a different photo. Like you see these gold buttons, they were just hidden under the gold buttons. Cause I'm like, oh, she already has like basically big buttons, like that's perfect. <laughs> so it's snapping on. <laughs> oh, and uh, the makeup, the makeup I wanted to talk about real quick is, um, I also kind of thought about how should I do the makeup? I need to be vampire white. So I was like, should I get, uh, should I like get an airbrush? Should I like, you know, like really make sure it's nice and smooth? And I was like, no, I, this costume is already so huge. I'm not traveling with an airbrush and a compressor and, you know, extension cords and plastic wrap and all that stuff. Like, no. So it simply is, um, it's actually uh, Mayron. It's Mayron, um, no, actually back then that was Carmilla. Mayron was for my dark elf. So for Carmilla, it was still Ben Nye, Ben Nye and Krylon um, cream makeup and it's just sponged on and then set with a setting spray. And um, if you don't want the makeup to get on your clothes, you can spray the inside of your clothes with Scotchgard. I have no idea if you guys have it here in Sweden. Scotchgard, they use it for cars, but it's like a spray that, that, that will then uh, sort of protect your clothing and will make so things won't rub off as as much there's got to be something comparable here but um i scotch guard like the bottom of skirts if my skirts drag the floor i will scotch guard the heck out of them so that they don't pick up as much dirt so like if you i don't know if you have a if you have dyed hair or, or dyed wig or something and you have like a white collar you can scotch guard the collar and then you don't have to worry about it you know so much um and i really wanted to do kind of like ugly pretty makeup. Like I didn't want, I really wanted to push the makeup to the level where it is a little bit bizarre. It's not like traditionally like glamour beautiful. So like the really dark, um, the dark uh, like cheekbones and uh, crazy eyebrows. And, um, and then I had like cat eyes in and like little elf ears and, and like of course vampire fangs. So it was just all around kind of bizarre. But I, I love transformation costumes like that, where you really can sort of make yourself feel and look like a completely different person. I really like things like that. Another question? I think any other questions about this? I think you were the second. You had your hand up earlier too. How do you do with the skirt? Do you have multiple layers? Or do you yeah, I have a hoop skirt and an underlayer petticoat and then um, the gold skirt over that and then the red skirt over that. So it's definitely a lot of it. But hoop skirt, definitely with, with an outfit like this, hoop skirt all the way. Yes? Me? Yeah. Uh, this is not a uh, question about this cosplay, but it's about armor. Uh, mm -hmm. Wearing a cosplay with a lot of armor can be really uh, uncomfortable. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you have like a tip to, or like how to, uh, how to make it a little bit more comfortable, I guess. Uh, armor. I mean, if if Kamui was here, she would be like, armor just sucks. Armor is just uncomfortable. And I'm like, you know, like when she she said that the first time I heard it, I'm like, well, we're screwed. <laughs> you know, like if she can't make armor comfortable, then I don't know. But I, I think padding, like just pat, like first of all, um, when you make the armor, like I am trying to always be aware when I make armor that it has to be a little bit, uh, it really has to be a little bit bigger than what you need, uh, just because you need to put padding on the inside and the padding will make it, you know, I was like if, if the armor just fits your bare, bare skin, but then you put padding on the inside of some sort, then it's going to be too tight, things like that. Or I um, use a lot of uh, elastic straps when I when I hook armor on. I think 
the having the right attachment, um, the attachments uh, uh, points is really important because you know, it, like I used to may I used to have costumes with really giant wings, and uh, if I supported the the wings only with my back by using a corset and um, sort of shoving the wings in with the spines then my back would not last very much. So I had to learn that you have to support, you have to have sort of like the, a three-point support. So it has to be around your shoulders, under your bust, and your back. Those are all the pieces that have to support something that's really big. So with armor, it's sort of the same. You have to balance it out. And uh, you know, you have to think about like, um, the where is it going to hit you for the majority of the day? So if you're able to alleviate some of the pressure in those areas by by you know by securing straps in other areas, then it will make it more balanced. And of course, making armor as lightweight as possible. That definitely is important. But um, but yeah, I I just think you know. Headliner foam is really good. I use I have like a giant roll of headliner foam in my house because I use it for Anything if I ever need to quilt something if I ever need something to look raised or you know look sort of like quilted I use headliner foam and it's also really good for gluing on the inside of um, of your your armor pieces Because it's like really soft spongy foam, but you can get it in pretty, you know thin layers Yes Absolutely. Um, I think these days we have so many, we have so many more options. Like it used to be that casting uh, resin pieces or using fiberglass was sort of like the staple in armor making. Like really, if you wanted to, you know, cosplay from uh, any like any sort of uh, you know heavy armored genre, it really had to be sculpted and then cast. But nowadays, we really are so lucky. Um, like one of my favorite materials is epoxy sculpt. And it's a two-part, it, it's like a two-part almost um, putty. It's a, it's, a, it's a putty that comes in two, um, I guess they're, they're like tins. And uh, you mix, you literally just grab, you make two eggs that are like about the same size. You mash it together, get it all like good, mesh together, and then you can sculpt with it. It's really crazy. Like you, you literally can sculpt with it. Um, and the best thing that I found is if you have like a base, you make a base out of foam or out of anything like to get the shape that you want. And then you use the epoxy sculpt to really get in with the details to, to sculpt all kinds of um, uh, filigree or uh, you know if you need to make borders around your armor and such or if you want to sculpt necklace pieces and such and um, you can use water like it's so simple you just use water to uh, to sort of activate it and be able to smooth it out like clay and once um, once you're done you let it dry for 24 hours and it hardens and becomes basically unbreakable you can literally weld uh, wire with this stuff and it's so great to have around uh, for detail work as well as uh, jewelry work and you know small prop work. So epoxy sculpt is something I really recommend. Um, if you are on a budget, paper clay is great. Uh, the air dry clay I used to use, like the Model Magic air dry clay, but it was very brittle. And you know, like if you don't mix it right with the, uh, like if you if you don't have the right conditions, if there's like too much humidity or something, it will start to crack. So that's maybe something that that is good for you know. It's, it's just not very sturdy, like I just wouldn't recommend it anymore. But um, resin casting still has a great big part in cosplay, I think. Like it's definitely not something that you that you should frown upon because Warbler is available or something. Um, because if you, 
like the, the great thing about resin is you don't have to make the pieces again and again. So if you have something that you know you need a lot of, you know, a lot of copies of, resin cast it, so that way you only have to make one or two molds and that's it. Um, but if it's just one single piece, then you could, you know, do something with epoxy sculpt, I think. So. Yes, Kelsey. Hey. Hi. Hi. <laughs> The wigs the, um, stick the wigs onto what? Uh, no, the cones that you stick the wigs. Oh yeah. To do that. Oh my God, yeah. I should have touched on that. Thank you. See, that's what I'm like. If I forget something, let me know. Um, I I think there 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 are various ways. I went with very simple. It's just uh, li little weft. You take little strips of the wig, and um, I just hot glue them onto one end and then wrap them around and hot glue them onto the other end. And so it just really tiny slips and you just kind of repeat it and repeat it and the hot glue is gonna melt into the, the, the cone. And so uh, it will emit, like it basically melts the plastic and, the, and the, the foam sort of together. And that's what is very easy. But you can also use um, like, I've also used uh, like, the 3M uh, spray glue, so you spray the cone, like just a little piece, and then you just kind of like put the hair on it. But I find that it, it's like, it's so sticky and messy that the hair even envelope just kind of gets like all ratty, and I'm just like, no! So I don't like using um, any glues that are really sticky to your hands for wigs, because I'm so clumsy, and I really like to, I would rather do the hot glue method and then use hairspray along the way to keep the flyaways at bay. And that's kind of how I have done a lot of my wigs over the years. Like, I don't know if I can, no, I don't have any pictures on here. This is the USB stick. Um, but yeah, just hot glue. And be careful, because you will probably burn yourself. So. Yes. Um, I I think I glued it the first time I wore it for the competition. Yes, um, and uh, the wig has like again it's like for some reason just sort of like I, I thought about it. I'm like do I have to make like an inner shell or something for the wig to stay on my head? And so I just kind of decided after I sewed the cones on to just kind of try it on and. Amazingly, just the cones kind of balance the wig out. So it literally goes on like a helmet, which is kind of funny because in the movie, they make a joke about her having helmet hair. And so I'm like, that actually is very true. So, so the wig literally just kind of slips on and, uh, um, and I glue the front down. And I, I think the second or third time I wore it, I didn't even bother gluing the front down and it still worked. So again, you just kind of like, you have to try things out and you know, think of simple solutions first, and if that doesn't work, then go to the more complicated solutions. I was wondering about undergarments for cosplay, like for example, if you were to find a big bra to get like, you know, nice effect, and like a sleeping wear as well, and do you have any suggestions? Um, I, I definitely am always on the lookout for like a good bra or, or bras that I can cut up in order to, you know, instead of like using padding, using a bra as the base for a lot of costumes. Um, Carmilla did not really have the option for that much padding, but that's where the boning was really helpful. So I construct a lot of my costumes with uh, boning and or end or padding uh, around the breast area just to make sure that it keeps the shape. So a lot of my corsets still have a, a padding inside the breast area just so it really just makes the shape look so much more more slick. And uh, even for, for costumes that traditionally like, don't need boning, I still sometimes put boning in because I really like, you know, I because my God, these characters, they wear clothes that are painted on, you know, like all of their clothes, doesn't matter, you know, so many of the characters have, have outfits on that literally just look completely painted on, no matter if they're like thick, you know, cowl hide or something. And so you have to really sort of um, approach cosplay costumes differently than, than fashion. 
And that's, that's another reason why if you use commercial patterns, a lot of times if you go by your size, the, pat the, the outfit will still be too big because normal clothes are not meant to fit so close. So really like all of my costumes are really like maybe like a size or half a size too small, including this jacket, you know, but because that's how it has to fit if, it, if you want that silhouette. So I work really hard to, uh, to, to making sure that all of my garments are tailored, but then that they have structure and strength within them so that they can handle, you know, being pulled at. Because like, I don't want anything to rip, but I'm wearing a jacket that's too small. <laughs> so, so it's like, it has to be strong enough to, to like, you know, hold, on, uh, to hold up to a lot of wear and tear. So. Any other questions? Or I have, I think I can, what was it, control L? I have like another, um, let's see what time we have. Okay, we have 20 minutes. I could show you another another process. I have my Xiaojun costume I have process. I was like, if we have time, I could do that. Good. So we'll go through it a little bit quicker because we only have 20 minutes. And honestly, you guys just stop me if you like see something you want to know more about. So when this game came out, I was like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Um, or when this, this, this artwork came out. When they announced the game and uh, published this, this artwork, I literally just remember like flipping a table and just going, this is it, all of my other costumes are on hold. And at the time I was actually making the wizard together with Kamui from Diablos 3. And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm making this instead. <laughs> so I completely left her in the lurch and she had her costume finished like two or three months before mine. But I literally was like, nope, I'm doing this instead. So it was like a week before New York Comic Con and I, spent, I think, that whole week in my sewing room and was like, I'm making this. So it was, it was kind of like my torrid love affair with Xiao Jun. <laughs> um, I really love that they are now like, at, like adding proper like reference. Like a lot of gaming companies are doing that. Um, I did not have that, obviously, when I made my costume, so my costume is not that accurate. But again, guess what? No one has said something to me about it not being accurate. So again, it's, it shows me that it's okay for you to take some creative liberty in order to sort of achieve your own cosplay dreams, you know? Um, so I used a lot of uh, materials I already had laying around the house, and so it was really going through my fabric bins and going, how does this look together? So this is a black uh, suede with a red um, faux leather trim. And then I did buy, I bought the brown brocade because just a few days before that picture came out, I had seen it in my local fabric store and I remember thinking it was really beautiful. And then when that picture came out, I was like, I'm going to the fabric store because <laughs> it just was perfect to me. Like just that really translated what I had in my head for the costume. Um, and I had bought a big piece of leather for a different costume that didn't happen. Uh, so I totally just, just took use of that and uh, used it for the Xiaojun costume. So this is the actual real leather. And um, of course, when I'm making, like, when I'm making costumes with a lot of pattern, like if it's a whole brocade, I always try to break it up because it just, it, it, it would have seemed to me like too much if the entire jacket had been that brocade. So I used uh, leather on the um, side pieces. So I do that, I do that a lot with my costumes where I will, I will sort of alternate between a pattern fabric and a solid fabric so that the garment still has the interest, you know, it still looks visually interesting, but it doesn't overwhelm your eyes so much. And of course everything is like, has to be top stitched because of just the, the nature of leather. Like here you can see it's not top stitch and does not look good. And you can't really iron leather that well. You'd have to like literally tape it open. So this is sort of like a question of the jacket. And um, I made sort of uh, the, the like 
I was like, there's a belt in the middle, so I can. I decided to divide up. So instead of it being a long jacket with flowing tails, I made a separate piece um, so that it'll be easier for me to drape everything that I wanted, you know, fit the length and exactly like the way I wanted things to drape. Um, so I do that a lot with costumes as well. Like even if it's a dress, if there's something in the middle, I'll make it into a bodice and a skirt just so it's a little easier to handle and you can be a little more precise with your construction. And there's a zipper, it's a zipper finish um, up there and then the frogs are just uh, decor decorative. You'll see me like going through the frogs. Oh, that's later. Okay, so this is sort of the armor and the armor was actually really simple. Um, you know, paper templates and uh, it's very important to get proportions right. On, on templates and to really think about the fact that when you are making your armor, your armor needs to be a little bigger than your paper templates because the armor is thicker, so when you bend it, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be as big. So, um, but paper templates, I flat pattern just about all of my armor pieces and these were actually really, really simplistic. And um, so they were all uh, sealed with um, Elmer's glue <laughs> or wood glue works and then I just dry brush them and because I only had a week for this costume I didn't have time to well red frogs are really hard to find anyway so I bought white frogs and just fabric colored them red so and then that's that's the one thing where I'm like if I had more time you know my my belt would look better and some of like the other pieces would look better but and I might have made them out of different materials but it was like Warbla, I have Warbla, let's go. For this I did not need padding because it went on top of my clothing but uh, where armor hurts is if it has to go on your naked shoulders or something. That's not fun. Or your naked arm or something. So this is how I, this, this I learned from Kamui as well. This is how I attach all of my armor pieces is with um, little toggles made out of Wonderflex and D-rings. Yeah? Do you have any tips on when you sew, you know, faux leather? Um, faux leather? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, walking foot. Get a walking foot, it's a crazy contraption and it's pretty expensive. Like in the States, it's between $35 and $50 for one foot. But what it does is your sewing machine, it, um, in the mechanism of your sewing machine, it walks the fabric because it has those little teeth and it walks your fabric on the bottom. But the top doesn't because you just have your foot. So the walking foot is a contraption that also walks your fabric. So you have both sides walking the fabric, meaning that you can really sew through anything. So it's like it could be eight layers of leather and uh, it's like it will go through smoothly. Um, so yes, walking foot, I love it, walking feet. <laughs> so. so this is the hood, the patterning of the hood. Um, one trick that I use that probably a lot of cosplayers also use is instead of, like I do mock-ups, I, I always do mock-ups for my costumes, which is I do a test garment to make sure that the fit is right, but I've learned <laughs> from, from, from many years that I'm lazy and I will do my mock-up on my lining fabric so that if I have to draw my lining fabric, it's okay, you know, it's like, it's just the lining. And uh, if it turns out all right, then I literally will use the lining fabric, you know, as the pattern piece for, the, for my expensive outer fabric. And then I don't have to cut out a third set of fabrics. And so this is the lining of the hood, which is also my mock-up for costumes. I don't know, does anybody else do that? Like, <laughs> do mock-ups on your lining fabric, yeah. I mean, it works. <laughs> So the hood has actually a foam, like a lot of people ask me like, oh, you have like that nice shape and it's like, it's a piece of craft foam on the inside. <laughs> so that's why it's like, just to make sure it gives it, you know, the, the right roundedness. So. Yeah, let me ask one more 
question. You chose not to have this eight shape. You chose mm -hmm. to have quite close feet, and I know you take liberties when you translate it. But may I ask uh, what your thinking was? Why did you want this classical shape, or you wanted this middle one? I, I think uh, honestly, it was because I was afraid that the hood would not have the right shape up here and especially here, like this was really important to me. And when I patterned it, it just seemed like if it went down further, like for me, it had the, the sort of like the, the risk of slipping. And um, I, I don't know, like it was just sort of a decision that I made on the spot and uh, it, it worked out. You know, like I was very happy with the shape of the hood. Um, but yeah, you're right, it's not accurate. <laughs> so. Thank you. So this is sort of like trying all the pieces on. And uh, those are the grommets that are just like pinned on to, to pin them in place. And um, I had another piece of leather, <laughs> another piece of thick leather that I had planned for the other same costume and that I didn't use. And so I actually already had leather straps to make all of her leather straps. So I ordered all of those snaps and had them overnighted because at that point I only had like three days left till the convention. So everything was like overnighted in and uh, I spent a whole evening um, making leather straps and covering them in those rivets and snaps and such. And leather works really fun too, I really like it. And uh, this is the costume inside, <laughs> my suitcase. I was like, I'm so happy it's done, take a picture. <laughs> so I actually got some really great pictures of this costume. Um, a journalist uh, wanted to um, document me getting ready for New York Comic Con. So it was really cool to actually have some photos of me, like some really good photos of me getting in costume and sort of the it was like a good memory because that was the first time I put on the full costume. And sometimes you need someone to help you, like like a fiance, to strap you in. And I'm like, that would be a cute headpiece. <laughs> wear the costume and I, this was a photo shoot done at a Chinese um, Chinese temple actually that was in LA <laughs> <laughs> so any questions I think we still have eight minutes nice <laughs> yes sir uh, what exactly got you into cosplay mm. I got me the same thing that gets everybody into cosplay, only I discovered it many years ago, um, as early as 1999. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to be a nerd running around in costume, because I was like, there are other people doing that. That is the coolest thing I could think of. <laughs> so yeah, it's like cosplay has developed really into like it's it's its own fandom now. Like that's the only thing I can. I can say it's like it really cosplay is an, its own fandom, but it used to be a way to express that you were a fan. So it used to be just like another. It used to be no different than like people, I don't know, purchasing a collectible of their favorite character, or wall scroll, or a T-shirt. Like it was just another form of being an anime fan or a comic book fan or whatever. And now cosplay is its own art form and its own like thing. And uh, it's, it's very interesting to have grown up and sort of seen the change over the years. So, but no, I just got into it because I got into it. <laughs> yes, Fluttershy. Uh, you wear a lot of wigs. Mm -hmm. And do you ever get headache from the wig? And what do you do to make it less painful? Yes, yes, I do. I get headaches from wigs. Um, I usually learn with each time I wear it, uh, if it's too tight, if it's too loose, um, uh, if I have to have something attached to the wig, like horns or whatever, or headpieces, um, usually the first time around is really painful because no matter how much you think that you've patterned it, it got all of the pressure points, you know, 
like when you wear it, you still are like, oh, it's rubbing right here. I should have padded right here more. And so honestly, I'm just like, it's a freaking learning experience each time with each new wig. Because it's like, even if you're just like, okay, I'm gonna sew clips into every wig and make sure that every piece is like, you know, supported in these ways, but at some point it's still gonna hurt. So, you know, um, headache medicine, you know, <laughs> actually drink water, drink a lot of water during conventions. Like, I, I hate drinking water at conventions because I can't pee very easily in some of my costumes. <laughs> But I, the, the longer I do conventions, the more I'm like, no, I have to drink water. Like, it doesn't matter. I have to take those, take those breaks and deal with the bathroom situation because I can't not hydrate during, because it's like, it really affects your body in so many ways and will make everything ache more. Everything that you wear will, will hurt more. And, uh, and then you won't have a nice experience. So, you know, make sure you take care of yourself and, Sleep, that's the other thing. <laughs> Sleep and, and drink water, and then you can handle your costumes with, you know, a lot more energy. Yes? Is it just the bandage on the short sleeve? Um, it's, this is the, um, this is the strap for the other armor piece. So, this is the armor piece, and honestly, like, you know, Looking at the pictures of it, it's like, you know, maybe I could have made the armor pieces a little bit bigger and wrap around more. And um, that might be something that I will revisit in the future because these pieces are pretty, pretty banged up anyway. But, um, but yeah, the short sleeves is just, is, it just goes to here with the armor piece. And then I actually had this cloth. I think it's supposed to be a bandage, but I did not have, you know, I did not have time to honestly like, sew strips of fabric together to do a bandage, so I just sewed a sleeve, and, um, but, but yeah, <laughs> you just kind of like, kind of wing it, and then it's okay, so, any other questions? Mm -hmm. How do you do with, like, do you do uh, your seams? Do you do hidden seams, or do you just sew? Oh, yeah, I use, I use a serger, so an overlock. And uh, oh my god, oh my god, recommend to everybody to get an overlock. Really, really, like a lot of people that I've spoken to are afraid of sergers because they require four different thread spools and they are difficult to thread and they also have a, have a blade that cuts your fabric. But instead of looking at it as, um, you know, something that only advanced you know, sewers are allowed to use or something, really take advantage of the fact that you can buy a serger for like $200, you know, like, like you can buy them online, you can buy them in, in stores, like you don't need a really fancy one. You literally just need one that binds your, your, your seams. And that's, that's a great thing about the serger is you can serge all of the edges, it won't fray, it will look nice and finished. And then when you sew your garment, it will last much longer. And so you are adding to the durability and the longevity of your, your costumes. <laughs> it's so cute. And so really, and it's, think of it as a tool that can only help you. Uh, so, so don't be afraid of it. Really think of it as, a, as a, something that's incredibly useful. Um, and get, to, get used to it early on, because you can find so many uses for it. Like, you can do the rolled hem where you on any of the chiffon, like really thin organza fabrics, instead of having to find a way to finish the edges, you just like run it through your serger and it will like bind the seam and look really pretty and you're just like, oh my god. <laughs> so, so yes. So that's really how I do all of my seams. If if it does if it doesn't need a lining. If I have to line something, I will just sew it. Like this jacket is just sewn. I did not need a serger for this jacket because everything is hidden inside, you know, the lining and that's, it's like finished with the lining. But it's still helpful uh, to serge all of the edges because then it makes your fabric more durable. So, it all depends. <laughs> okay, we have time for one last question. One last question. Someone had a question? Okay, I will take, take, take the young man over there. <laughs> So when you begun cosplay, did you go with the heavy, complicated projects directly, or did you start easy and then 
the more you you learn the every projects. I started. Um, I would say compared to cosplayers nowadays, I started very easy, very very easy, um, and you know there were just hardly any resources around. So even if you wanted to make a set of armor, no one knew how to. So like there was literally like nobody that could give you any sort of even idea of of what direction to go go in. So. I stuck with uh, sewing because that that was a lot cheaper, and uh, it, you know I was able to to get my hands on it like a forty dollar used sewing machine, and uh, I bought fabric by the pound, which that kind of like literally by weight, um, which tells you what kind of fabric places I went to. <laughs> just, uh, but it was really just a practice, like just continuously practicing and um, learning by failing repeatedly, like making something that would fall apart and you're just like, okay, what, what do I have to do on my next costume so it doesn't fall apart again? You know, like I, I, sewed, a vel I sewed a pair of vel velvet pants before using the same velvet that I used for Carmilla, but I did not have a serger, I did not think to, you know, do anything to the seams, and of course halfway through the con, the seams started coming apart because I'm like, oh, the velvet disintegrates, okay, you know, did not know that. So that costume had to be thrown away. Um, but then the next time I used that velvet, I was like, all right, everything has to be surged, you know? So it's like stuff like this, you really learn by making awful mistakes. Um, and so as I gained skill, that's when I think I started doing bigger projects. And um, even to this day, I, I feel like, I, I mean, the first time I tackled a armor, a armor costume was in like 2012. So it took me still many years to to really get the courage up to go for, you know, more bigger armor costumes. And I still have never made a full giant set of armor. You know, all my armor is warbler and ornate, or you know, some armor pieces are like rubber, like the back girl and such but um, I would like to make something in the future using EVA foam and do something very futuristic, just for the sake of trying it out and understanding it more, you know, because I, I do, I judge a lot of contests and it's important for me to know a lot, as much as I can about every type of technique. Even if I don't use it myself, I need to know how these techniques are, um, are applied so that I can, you know, make informed decisions and such. So um, I think cosplay is definitely a journey of like learning and just the, you have a thirst for learning and experimenting and uh, being incredibly creative. And that's why I still love doing it. <laughs> so on that note, we're going to end it. <laughs>